Waar die wilgers vredig spreid, door een boom sy skari sprei. Soos ons groei en kindigheid, mag u ons vrij. Sien ons hoe hier, lei met die hand, laat u sien dus voor ons vrij. Strong streams, united flow, every curse stands proud and tall. As we learn, we trust, we know, God is in control. Bless us, O oh Lord, guide us with grace. Goedenavond, good evening. Dear honored guests, um, it is indeed a privilege for me and also Marida to have been invited to witness the inauguration of Professor Natasha de Klerk tonight. I know Natasha as a young undergraduate, full of talent, a youth leader, a cheerful lady, always with a broad smile on her face, even today. And I can still recall how her fellow students used to request her to sing a favorite song, which she would do without any hesitation. And this is, usually this was followed by a roaring round of student applause. Prof. de Klerk was the humble student with healthy self-esteem and a whole bunch of dedication. And her career proves that. She excelled by obtaining her academic qualifications and nevertheless, she remains the Natasha with a broad smile, the one with integrity, the one with humility and wisdom. This achievement of tonight reminds me of Ralph Boston, an Olympic gold medal winner, who said that one becomes a winner when you are the first athlete that is crossing the finishing line. But what really counts is what you are doing and what you are going to do after you cross that line. I want to read a few verses from Proverbs 31. Um, I read from the uh, NLT because I think it simplifies the text and it puts it in a, in a language that we all use every day. And these 21 verses of Proverbs 31 are for us examples of how we should behave as virtuous women and men of God. Uh, I'll break it down into something um, a little easier to understand, and I will read only certain verses of Proverbs 31. The heading states, a wife of, a noble, char of noble character, a wife of noble character. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? 
She is more precious than rubies. She finds wool and flax and busily spins it. She's hardworking, therefore. She is clothed with strength and dignity. And she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise. Her words are wise. And she gives instructions with kindness. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world. But you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive. And beauty does not last. But the woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. Now this, this very last verse, verse 31, is for me the main text tonight. In the Amplified uh, Bible it says, Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works Praise her in the gates of the city. Proverbs 31 describes a wise woman who could rise above the culture of the day in the Old Testament world. It also provides a corrective to the chauvinistic views of the, of, uh, at that time of the Old Testament. The text um, helps us to, to understand that the meaning of life largely exists in the service that we are rendering to God and to each other. In verse 30, it connects the meaning of life with the service to the Lord. Now, allow uh, allow me to to highlight a few virtuous uh, uh, virtuous of, of a wise woman. Of course, also applicable to us as men, as wise men, according to to Proverbs 31 in verse 10, we found that the virtuous woman is very precious, with more than precious stones. So God comes and he calls us to be virtuous and to be capable to set the goals in our lives and to achieve it. In verse 11, faithfulness is emphasized, and we are called here to speak the truth and to earn the trust of others. Proverbs 31 states the importance of hard work. God calls us to be hard workers indeed and to continuously improving ourselves as graceful human beings. When we look at verse 26, it says that we should always think before we speak. And always, to use kind words, we should therefore be wise in what we say, therefore think before you speak. Because words may have a negative impact also on other people. With God in our hearts, we can achieve almost anything that we set our sights on. Verse 29 Verse 29 tells us that we can achieve much in this world and that with God in our hearts, we will succeed and we will excel. Why should we do all these things? Because we should live in such a way that we always, always honor God. Which brings us to the last verse, uh, verse 31. For me, that is a verse that is truly relevant uh, at this prestigious occasion of rewarding and celebrating remarkable achievements. Verse 31 reads, Let her own works praise her in the gates. Let her own works praise her in the gates. Of course, the gates of the city. Now, um, this last verse tells you Prof. de Klerk, that you will be praised for your hard work and dedication tonight, for being a virtuous woman and a well-respected academic. Also, that you should continue to do all the things that God is expecting of you. And by doing that, 
you will be brought even closer to him. Honor God in all things. Be strong and endure hard times. Put faith in the Lord to help you. And um, when you feel maybe lost, keep on with your good work. As an academic, enrich your life with knowledge, with more understanding, and become a well-rounded in all your skills. Prof. de Klerk, you may also cross the finishing line in the words of the gold medal athlete, but what really counts is what you are going to do after you've crossed this line. My, my, my Proverbs 31 became one of your uh, favorite studies, in this case maybe a spiritual study amongst all the others in your own discipline, and may it guide you when you cross this line. Take it to heart every day. Take it to heart every, every day. And may it guide you towards a bright future. And when or if you fail, remember God's grace is there. He will help you back on track. Prof. de Klerk, tonight we will witness and we will celebrate the truth of verse 31. Give her the fruit of her hands. Let's say it also, and her mind, which means give her what she deserves and let her own works praise her in the gates of the city. If you translate that in Afrikaans, professor, it will be, gee haar wat haar toekom, vir alles wat sy doen. Laat haar werk haar roem wees in die stadspoorte. Tonight you will receive what you deserve for all that you have done. Let your work be your glory and may the Lord be praised for it, for all his blessings in your life. In, in your life. Let us pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for your great love for your blessings over our lives. Thank you for, for this day, for this special occasion, this opportunity that you granted us to come together in gratitude because you have blessed Natasha and all of us beyond measure. We pray, dear Lord, Lord for your watchful care protection, and provision of our needs. And we also thank you for the blessings that you bestowed on Natasha, for demonstrating that, that you pre provided her with more than she could ever, ever imagine. Bless also the rest of this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Herman van der Merwe, and I'm the Deputy Dean Teaching and Learning on the Van der Bell Park campus. And it's my privilege to welcome you all to this inaugural address tonight. A specific word of welcome to Professor Linda Duplessis, our Vice Principal and Deputy Vice Chancellor Planning and Campus Operations at the Van der Bell Park campus. And may I also say, our incoming acting vice-chancellor. <laughs> she, she, will, she will act uh, as vice-chancellor as from February next year. I'd also like to welcome Prof. Ntebo Moroke, our acting executive dean. She's online. Prof. Bab Surjal, our deputy dean for research and innovation. 
Professor Dan Metzeleng, our Acting Deputy Dean for Community Engagement, who's also online. Both Prof. Ntebo and Prof. Dan are in Mahikeng. Then Prof. Renier Janssen van Rensburg, the Director of the School of Management Sciences, and the two Deputy Directors of the School of Management Sciences, Prof. Marius Potgieter and Prof. Alp Henrico. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Hans Brits, who I think took some of, uh, you know, read my speech in some way, because uh, I think there's some words that you're going to find in there as well. To all the directors and deputy directors present, and also all of you who are online. Colleagues who are here present uh, in the room, as well as colleagues online. And of course, the reason why we're here tonight, Prof. Natasha, your friends and family. Now, I, I googled the word professor, and the concept professor was first recorded in the late 14th century, and is directly deducted from Latin, which means a person who professes or to be an expert in some art or science or a teacher of the highest rank. Now, as a noun, the word is profiteri, which means to lay claim to or to declare openly. So you hear some of the things that are going to happen tonight, declare openly and so on. It was first recorded in 1706 as a title prefixed to a name, and the short form prof was first recorded in 1838. Now, with all, with all of that in mind, uh, the Northwest University, in recognition of excellence, you hear the words excellence, you also hear it from, from what we've heard from, this, from the scripture, excellence and exceptional academic leadership, uh, we confer that bearer of these qualities, the highest academic title of professor. So I must say, a Northwest University, but I, maybe I can say, more specifically, a faculty professorship comes with some stringent requirements and responsibilities. It is, for instance, expected of a professor in our faculty to be an intellectual leader in the subject field. Be recognized by colleagues and industry as a leader in the field. Be extensively involved in sharing their knowledge with their peers and industry to initiate and create research opportunities and guide and supervise students, train and encourage other staff members and act as a role model for their juniors and students. They make a substantial contribution to the effective management and functioning of the school and the faculty, and is of course an outstanding lecture. Now with all of that said, I may now declare I can't say like the registrar usually say, you know, by the powers vested in me, but yeah. <laughs> I can now declare that Professor de Klerk has complied with all these criteria as set by the University for Excellence and Academic Leadership. And that is why we're all here today at this inaugural lecture. The inaugural address is an opportunity for a newly promoted professor to inform colleagues, peers, and the general public about their research career thus far and update us on their current and future research directions. And this really marks the pinnacle of a professor's intellectual pursuit. And now that we do it online, it is also publicly available. How wonderful is that? An inaugural address also represents an essential component of the university and the faculty's public events program, helping us to create a broader awareness of the latest developments in research in the faculty and also in the broader university context. The Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences are very proud and privileged to have seven staff members presenting inaugural addresses this year in various disciplines. And Prof. Natasha, tonight you can really celebrate this important personal milestone with family, friends, and colleagues. 
As we all know, we've heard that she's passionate. As we all know that marketing and Generation Y is her passion. But I must, some, must confess, I had some inside information, and I think you should buckle up. Because fashion trends among, amongst South African Generation Y uh, uh, is really something that we can look forward to. Colleagues, with these few words, I welcome you all here tonight. And I'm going to request Prof. Nir Janssen van Rensburg, the academic director of the school, to introduce Prof. Natasha to us. Prof. Nir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Prof. Linda, Prof. Herman, Prof. Babs, Prof. Ntebu, Prof. Dan, Prof. Alf, Prof. Marius, the colleagues of the school, colleagues of the faculty, friends and family, uh, Prof. Natasha, now I will say Prof, but not the rest of the evening. <laughs> uh, it is a privilege for me and a great pleasure to do this introduction. But before I'm doing that, few words, congratulations on this evening, and thank you for what you are doing for the school, the part you're playing in the management of the school. You know, uh, before Prof. Alf, uh, was appointed, we, we call ourselves the three musketeers of the school. Uh, we must decide who is Brak and Jan. <laughs> but now Prof. Alf is there, and I think there are four musketeers. So, but thank you for the good work that you are doing. Uh, and I wish you well for the future to take this achievement further and enrich it to something higher. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I will do the introduction. Natasha was born in Port Shepson on 6 February 1975 to Kobus and Adele Pretorius. She is the youngest of the three daughters. Natasha is married to Quentin, and they have two sons, namely Neelan and Dylan. Natasha attended primary school in Sabi and Barberton and matriculated from Impangania High School in 1992. She has a national diploma, a national higher diploma, and an MTech in marketing from the Wahl University of Technology, as well as a national diploma in tourism from the same institution, which she passed cum laude. Natasha completed her PhD in business management at the Northwest University in 2009. Natasha started her academic career at the Wahl University of Technology where she lectured for 12 years. In 2010, she joined the NWU as a lecturer in the School of Economic Sciences on the Van der Beil Park campus, campus and was promoted to senior lecturer in 2011 and later to associated professor in 2014. In the beginning of 2020, she was promoted to full professor in the School of Management Sciences. In 2011, Natasha was the co-founding member of the Progeny Niche Research Group that is dedicated to profiling the consumer psychology of the South African youth generation, currently categorized as Generation Y. She was authored numerous international as well as nationally 
accredited publications and conference papers and has, has successfully supervised in excess of 20 masters and doctoral students. Her research interests include fashion marketing, consumer behavior, and uh, generational studies. Natasha is a well-rounded academic involved in many activities at the university, and she is currently the deputy director of the School of Management Sciences on the Van der Beyl Park campus. And with that, Prof. Natasha, it's over to you. Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Acting Executive Dean of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences, Deputy Deans, Directors, eminent fellow professors, colleagues, distinguished guests, including everyone joining us online. Good evening and thank you for attending this inaugural address marking my promotion to full professor. It is truly a great honor. After almost two years of only interacting virtually, it is a great privilege to stand in front of a live audience tonight. The focus of my address is on fashion trends among South African Generation Y, which is an area of study that reflects my research journey over the past few years. This dissertate includes an overview of the fashion industry, the conceptualization of fashion, the evolution of fashion, together with the significance of Generation Y to the fashion industry, I will then go on to discuss my specific research interest area, which is fashion trends among South African Generation Y. This discussion will conclude with my predictions on future fashion trends. So what makes fashion so special? Fashion is indicative of everything in the world. From economic status to social changes, it is a visual representation of history unfolding right before our eyes. It is a language understood and spoken by individuals globally. It is all around us, comprising all aspects of our life and encroaching on all areas of consumption, such as art, music, architecture, dance, food, cars, apparel, beauty products, and the like. In its simplest form, fashion is perceived as the material and non-material aspects that consumers surround themselves with and use to manage their outward appearance. The interdisciplinary nature of fashion stems from its roots in social, cultural, and economic spheres, including the processes by which fashion diffuses within and among societies. The purposes it serves in social differentiation and integration, its satisfaction of psychological needs, as well as its implications for contemporary economic life. As a result, the phenomenon of fashion consumption behavior has been an important subject of social analysts, moral critics, cultural historians, business practitioners, and academic theorists for decades. In the fashion industry, the most recognized categories are apparel and beauty products, with apparel comprising clothing, footwear, and accessories, 
including handbags, shoes, and jewelry, and beauty products, including color cosmetics, fragrances, hair care, personal care, and skin care products. Fashion apparel products are mainly segmented according to quality, price, and production volume, and cover high-end, middle-end, and low-end products, which can be broadly categorized into three tiers, namely haute couture, pret-a-porter, and fast fashion. On the high end of the tier is haute couture, which refers to high price, custom fitted designs made from high quality material, like designs from fashion designers such as Chanel, Dior, and Versace. In contrast, Preta Porter, also known as ready to wear designer brands, include more affordable designs sold at finished condition in standardized sizes by world famous fashion houses. On the lower end of the tier is fast fashion, which refers to designs that move quickly from the catwalk to the store in order to capture current fashion trends by mass manufacturing them at a low cost, like those from major apparel retail companies such as Zara and H&M. Beauty products, on the other hand, are generally categorized as luxury brands, prestige brands, and value brands. Luxury brands are on the high end of the tier and include expensive products made from high quality ingredients that come in premium packaging, like products from beauty brands such as Chanel, La Meur, and La Prairie. Prestige brands include more affordable products that are available at department stores, for example, from major beauty brands such as Clinique, L'Oreal, and Clarence. And on the lower end of the tier are value brands, which are low-cost products that are typically available at drugstores such as Yardley, Maybelline, and Revlon. The fashion industry is char characterized as being highly dynamic and fast-paced with a high level of uncertainty. Consumers' preferences and behavior change constantly, and as such, the fashion industry is in a constant state of change as emerging fashion trends supersede previous trends. Paramount to the success of the fashion industry is the ability of role players to predict and react swiftly to emerging trends. To give you an idea of how significant the fashion industry is, let's consider its contribution to both the global and South African economies. The global apparel and footwear sector generated about 1.5 trillion US dollars in consumer spending in 2020, a figure that is expected to grow to approximately 2.25 trillion dollars by 2025. Not only is fashion one of the largest consumer industries, but it is also a major job creator, employing an estimated 60 million people globally in 2016. Particular lucrative market segments in the fashion industry are those for luxury fashion apparel and beauty products. In terms of world markets, the most important producer generating the most revenue from fashion apparel globally is China, followed by Europe and India. The largest fashion retail markets are the United States of America, followed by China and Japan. After the Middle East, Africa is currently the world's second fastest growing market for the consumption of luxury products. Africa holds strong potential for luxury brands due to its robust economic growth, increased affluence, and a growing population that is forecasted to double by 2050. Fashion companies range from small independent businesses to large multinational corporations comprising various brands. The largest fashion company worldwide is Louis Vuitton Mouet Hennessy, specializing in luxury brands such as Louis Vuitton, Fendi and Dior, followed by the athleisure and lifestyle brand Nike. The most valuable apparel brand globally is Nike, followed by Gucci, Adidas and Louis Vuitton. From a retail sales perspective, the Spanish clothing brand Zara is the world's largest fashion apparel brand, followed by Uniqlo and H&M. 
As part of the fashion industry, the beauty product sector was valued at over 500 billion US dollars in 2019. With a projected annual growth rate of 4.75%, this sector is predicted to exceed more than $700 billion in 2025. The largest beauty product market globally is the United States of America, followed by China. In 2020, L'Oreal ranked the most valuable beauty product brand, followed by Gillette and Nivea. From a retail sales perspective, L'Oreal is also the leading beauty product company, followed by Unilever and Estee Lauder. It is worth noting that the size and continued growth of the luxury fashion industry have resulted in many luxury fashion designers becoming targets for fake or counterfeit products. In 2020, the counterfeit luxury fashion industry was valued at an estimated 50 billion US dollars a year in consumer spending. While there is a strong demand for designer products, they are out of many consumers' financial reach. And this has significantly spurred the demand for counterfeit luxury fashion products, since it enables an affiliation with prestigious or status brands, but at a vastly reduced price. Another sector of the fashion industry that is gaining in momentum is the wearable technology sector. Because of the growing trend of merging fashion styles with technology, the demand for wearable technologies such as wearable activity tracking devices that are both functional and stylish is experiencing a surge in growth. In 2020, the wearable technology market had an estimated value of approximately 40 billion US dollars. An interesting development in the fashion industry is that there has been a definite move towards embracing the digital environment, which is partly the result of the disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. But while many fashion companies adopted a hybrid retail model even prior to the pandemic, more are now reassessing their traditional retail models and are going online or innovating their e-commerce businesses. More are now also turning to social media and social networking sites to create more engaging and social experiences designed to encourage consumers to connect with their brands. Fashion is now one of the dominant e-commerce market segments generating approximately 752 billion US dollars in 2020, which is expected to increase to approximately 1.1 trillion dollars by the end of 2025. In terms of the South African fashion industry, South Africa is one of the top fashion markets in Africa. In 2018, the recorded retail sales of textiles, clothing and footwear amounted to more than 175 billion rand, contributing approximately 8% to the country's manufacturing GDP and 3% to the country's total GDP annually. During the past decade, the country's fashion retail sector has experienced a proliferation of international brands with major fashion retailers like Topshop, Cotton On, Superdry, Zara, Gap, and H&M opening stores in the country. Apart from the increased availability of international clothing brands, the South African fashion retail sector is dominated by national brands such as Pepcourt, TFG, Mr. Price, Woolworths, and Truers. In addition, Various local fashion designer brands are attracting both national and international buyers, such as Stone Cherry, Imprint, Black Coffee, David Schlale, Stitch and Steel, Mancho, and Marianne Fassler. Interestingly, David Schlale completed his undergraduate degree in fashion design at the Vol University of Technology, my former institution. Concerning the beauty products sector, South Africa has proven to be highly lucrative with an estimated worth of 27 billion rand at the retail level in 2017 and an annual compound growth rate of 4.6%. Major brands dominating the sector include Colgate, Palm Olive, Unilever SA, Procter & Gamble, L'Oreal SA, 
Estee Lauder, and Avon. As a market for wearable technology, such as smartwatches and fitness trackers, South Africa is also showing much promise. South Africa also has a strong mall culture, which is important to luxury brands seeking to establish high-end retail outlets. The country's shopping mall retail sector comprised more than 2,300 shopping malls in 2021. Compared to other African countries, South Africa has modern and well-developed shopping malls, attracting shoppers from across the continent. In 2017, this sector contributed 65% towards the total income of the retail industry and ranked sixth globally in terms of the highest number of shopping malls in a country. Coupled with a transport infrastructure and consumers who are keen to splurge, South Africa continues to attract several international luxury, luxury retailers to enter and establish outlets in various shopping malls, such as Prada, Burberry, Jimmy Choo, Gucci, and Giorgio Armani. We can see from the fashion industry's significant size, both globally and in the South African market, that fashion plays a pivotal role in consumers' lives. But what is fashion? Fashion is both a noun and a verb. As a noun, fashion means a popular or the latest style of clothing, hair, decoration, or behavior. And as a verb, it indicates a manner of doing something. This suggests that fashion is both an object as well as a process, implying change and transformation. In the fashion marketing literature, various frequently cited scholars' seminal notions pertaining to individual social dynamics connect fashion with sociological matters that are interrelated to consumer behavior and society at large. As a core element in consumers' lives, fashion reflects a continual process of change in mutual interrelationships and interdependencies over time and place, shaping the array of fashion products desired and consumed. The concept of fashion is such that it remains popular for only a limited period of time, such as a season, a year, or a decade. Irrespective of the duration, due to the fluid nature of fashion, something which is unfashionable today will inevitably lose popularity at some point and become unfashionable and be replaced by a new fashion and the cycle starts again. The cycle of the adoption of fashion trends as they move from one social stratum of a society to another over time is explained by the trickle up, trickle down and trickle across movement theories. The trickle up theory introduced by Field implies that the adoption of a fashion style moves upwards, denoting that a fashion is first adopted by members of the lower echelons of society and then trickles up to other members of that society meaning that it is accepted at higher echelons. The trickle-down theory, coined by Veblen, postulates that in a hierarchical society, the fashion trends of the higher echelons of society are imitated by the lower echelons of society, who are aspirational consumers. Once that fashion gains wider social acceptance, the elite reject the style and adopt a new style. In contrast, the trickle across theory put forward by King asserts that fashion trends are spread simultaneously across different echelons of society through mass production that makes fashion items available at different price points, as well as mass communication, popular media, and the promotional efforts of manufacturers and retailers. Sproul's then added a fourth theory of fashion adoption to the fashion marketing literature, namely the youth-driven fashion diffusion theory. According to this theory, the youth, who are often seen as leaders in social movements that enact changes in society, use fashion, including fashion apparel, to signal their political and social ideologies, and as such 
are a significant and visible influence on the initiation and diffusion of fashion trends. And this brings me to the evolution of fashion. The evolution of fashion relates to human history because it reflects a social system's values, attitudes, ideologies, and situation at a given point in time. Important periods that have influenced global fashion history include the Dark Ages, the Medieval period, the Tudor and Stuart times, the Renaissance era, the Georgian period, the Victorian era, and the Edwardian age. While it is unclear when the concept of fashion first originated, fashion as we know it today came about during the European Renaissance with a surge in interest in politics, economics, art, architecture, and food, including the experimentation with different clothing styles and accessories. Characterized by mass production, mass consumption, and mass media, Fashion became an established in industry in the 20th century. Owing to new technologies such as the sewing machine and machine-made textiles, production methods improved significantly. These advancements, together with an increase in disposable income, transformed popular culture. In addition, the changing role of women in society and socialization of consumers across different socioeconomic groups led to a significant increase in consumerism and the need for affordable, ready-to-wear clothing across social and economic strata. Triggered by suburbanization, higher economic growth, and mass ownership of cars following the end of World War II, the shopping mall concept was introduced, introduced in the USA in the 1950s. During the late 20th century, globalization introduced transnational businesses, cyber technology, and electronic mass media, such as the television and the internet, leading to the dissemination of fashion trends globally. In particular, the use and adoption of the internet and e-commerce introduced digital communication and media. Because of the increased demand for trendier clothes at lower prices, the fast fashion phenomenon originated towards the end of the 20th century. The postmodern era of the mid 20th century saw the emergence of the youth as an identifiable and potentially lucrative fashion market segment with unique fashion style preferences. Lending weight to Sproul's youth driven fashion diffusion theory, there are several examples of how youth movements as drivers of social change and impelled by popular culture, politics, celebrities, fashion icons, pop stars, and the like, have initiated fashion trends in the postmodern era. In the 1950s, the rock and roll movement, led by Elvis Presley, rebelliously encouraged new freedoms for the youth and led to fashion trends such as denim jeans, slick back hair, and ponytails. In the 1960s, the hippie movement that promoted love and nonviolence gave rise to loose-fitting, brightly colored, tie-dyed clothes, and designer Mary Quaint popularized miniskirts. In the 1970s, the punk movement, which was anti-capitalism, conformity, and the establishment, initiated dyed mohawk hairstyles, studded leather jackets, combat-styled boots, and body piercings, propagated by fashion designers like Vivian Westwood and bands like the Sex Pistols. The hip-hop movement, rooted in civil rights and black power, created a passion for the streetwear style. In the 1980s, the new romantic movement that promoted individualism popularized big hair, vivid makeup, and eccentric clothing, and was propagated by pop stars such as Boy George and Madonna. In contrast, the 1990s grunge movement, which was cynical of consumerism and societal norms, promoted the androgynous style trend, with ripped jeans worn in t-shirts and oversized flannels, and was influenced by music bands like Navarra, Nirvana and Marilyn Manson. 
Therefore, throughout modern history, the youth of each generation have played an important and conspicuous role in the initiation and diffusion of new fashion trends, making them a salient target segment in the fashion industry. Today's youth, categorized as Generation Y, are of particular interest to the fashion industry given the size of this segment and their significant and growing spending power, both globally and locally. So what then is the significance of Generation Y to the fashion industry? As the first generation to come of age in the new millennium, they are digitally astute, ultra-connected. They spend a remarkable amount of their time in the digital environment, searching for and sharing information and experiences quickly and easily. In addition, they use various technologically advanced applications to monitor every aspect of their lives. They have a fondness for shopping and frequently visit shopping malls, earning them the title of mall rats. While they are highly aware of ethical and environmental issues, international studies suggest that they are also materialistic and fashion conscious, have a strong desire for variety, are concerned with status consumption, and often engage in impulse buying behavior. There's also a strong indication that they are fixated with style. Interestingly, this generation has also been found to be more likely to purchase counterfeit products. A possible reason for this is that while they aspire to owning luxury fashion brands, they may as young adults lack the required financial resources to do so currently. They are also highly susceptible to influences from the social environment such as their family, friends, and social media, with social media in particular having a strong impact on their lives. As the intellectual elite of their generation, Generation Y university students are likely to manifest as opinion leaders and trendsetters amongst their peers within a given society and take a lead role in social movements and in including inducing social change. As such, university students provide a good reflection of their generation's fashion consumer behavior, as well as a particularly attractive target market for fashion marketers and retailers. Generally, the findings in South Africa echo the view that Generation Y consumers are indeed fixated with style. However, there are certain differences. In terms of their demographics, they made up approximately 35% of South Africa's population in 2020. As part of the Progeny Research Group, I, along with my colleagues and students, have conducted several studies seeking to profile South African Generation Y university students' fashion trends and fashion purchase behavior, which I would like to share with you. Our findings suggest that South African Generation Y are fashion conscious. They also exhibit status consumption and materialistic tendencies. And in another study, we also found that this fashion consciousness extends to the male cohort of this generation, a factor that is heavily influenced by the need for uniqueness. From a local fashion manufacturer's viewpoint, a promising finding from yet another study was that Generation Y individuals in South Africa exhibit a, exhibit a high level of consumer ethnocentrism, meaning that they are loyal to local brands. Much like their global counterparts, in studies we conducted on shopping mall behavior and motives for shopping, our findings suggest that South African Generation Y consumers live up to their title of being mall rats with their motives for visiting malls, including their desire for shopping convenience, aesthetic stimulation, and the, to generally experiencing the pleasurable state of flow. Building on this study, we then took a closer look at the hedonic and utilitarian motives for shopping, 
Concerning the hedonic shopping motives, major drivers were found to be adventure seeking, socializing with others, and keeping up to date with new fashion trends. Whilst their primary utilitarian motives included goal achievement, task completion, and shopping efficiency. Given the importance of impulse purchasing on the consumer behavior literature, we then considered the antecedents thereof among South African Generation Y consumers. These included sales promotion, reference groups, and in-store atmospherics, as well as availability. Not surprisingly, we found that females are more inclined than males to buy on impulse. As I mentioned earlier, the beauty product market is sizable, both globally and locally, and we have done several studies in this regard. Our findings suggest that the primary drivers influencing female generation Y individuals' beauty product consumption intentions include personal vanity, price consciousness, variety seeking and status consumption tendencies, product innovation needs, subjective norms, as well as the influence of the media, celebrities and reference groups. In contrast to impulse buying, we then looked at the determinants of South African generation wise individuals brand equity. Important elements identified included that they are attracted to brands with a trendy image and features. Other factors that foster brand loyalty include advertising, pricing and store image and collectively these influences their brand awareness, perceived quality, brand associations, brand loyalty and ultimately brand equity. Driven in part by Generation Y consumers' desire to digitally monitor every aspect of their lives, we also considered the attitudes towards wearable tracking devices in the South African context. Our findings suggest that they have a favorable attitude towards such devices, viewing them as being attractive and trendy, as contributing favorable, favorably to their social image, worth the cost, easy to use, and useful to their lives in general. I personally foresee this particular market growing significantly in the future. Of course, luxury fashion brands, including smart watches, are aspirational, and students naturally don't always have the financial means to acquire these status products. Hence, I engage in a study to ascertain the attitude towards counterfeit products. Interestingly, and contrary to my initial assumptions, I found them to have a negative attitude towards the purchase of these counterfeit luxury brands. Not only do they perceive the purchase thereof as being damaging to the intellectual property, interest and rights of the original fashion brand manufacturers, but also the fashion industry in general. All factors that bode well for manufacturers and marketers of authentic luxury fashion brands and the future of South Africa's econom economic growth, given the importance of this generation's likely influence on future generations' attitude and behaviors towards counterfeit products. In line with this finding, in another study I conducted, I found that Generation Y students use price as an indicator of fashion product quality. In addition, they exhibit materialistic and status consumption tendencies and consider the opinions of others when purchasing fashion products. Furthermore, there are significant positive relationships between their favorable price quality fashion attitudes, their tendency to engage in status consumption when purchasing fashion products, material success and happiness tendencies, and the influence of subjective norms on their fashion consumption. Of these tendencies, subjective norms and status consumption were found to have the strongest influence on the favorable price quality fashion attitudes. This suggests that the price quality fashion attitudes are influenced by status consumption, materialistic tendencies, and subjective norms. 
Moving forward now to my planned future research. While the fashion industry is typically perceived as being exciting and glamorous, the industry is notoriously associated with many environmental, social, and ethical issues. And these include things like unfair labor practices, cultural appropriation, sustainability, transparency in the supply chain, fast fashion, and the like. Just to give you an example, after the oil industry, the fashion industry is the second largest contributor to waste and climate change, mainly because of its unsustainability and non-eco-friendly production methods. Did you know that to produce one pair of jeans requires 3,781 liters of water? From the production of the cotton to the delivery of the final product in the store. Recent study findings suggest that Generation Y consumers are becoming increasingly aware of the impact of fashion and are adopting the growing slow fashion movement and embracing sustainable and ethical production processes as well as supporting locally made fashion brands and retailers. These consumers are the architects of the woke culture and are vigilant about social and racial discrimination and injustices in society. They are driving social changes in the fashion industry and are passing their ideologies on to not only their peers, but also their parents and the upcoming generation of youths, namely Generation Z. Hence, we are seeing the uptake of androgynous clothing, vegan fashion, gender neutral beauty products, as well as jewelry made from recycled or ecological metals, conflict-free gemstones, and lab-grown diamonds. One of the positives to come out of this whole COVID-19 pandemic has been a growing reliance on local clothing and textile manufacturers in an effort to overcome global supply chain problems. This development will appeal to Generation Y consumers' ecological concern, given, the sourcing, given that sourcing locally decreases an industry's carbon footprint. Over and above this, future fashion trends rooted in sustainable fashion consumption behavior that I predict will gain traction include sustainability becoming more fashionable than fast fashion, reusing or renting instead of purchasing new clothes and accessories, purchasing previously owned fashion items, upcycling and reconstructing clothes, hemp and organic cotton clothing, recycled synthetic fabric clothing and accessories, as well as environmentally friendly and organic beauty products. Of course, engaging in more ethically and ecologically conscious consumption is more expensive. And as an emerging economy, South Africa faces several socioeconomic problems, such as high unemployment and poverty. Therefore, from a marketing point of view, future studies into determining the perceived importance and influence of social consciousness and sustainability on Generation Y consumers' fashion consumption behavior will provide an indication of this target market's inclination towards actual purchase intentions, towards sustainable fashion products, and towards supporting social conscious fashion brands and retailers. In conclusion, fashion is a fundamental part of people's lives. Apart from being functional, it is also a way of expressing individual qualities and fulfilling innate human needs which contribute to the dynamics and complexity of fashion as reflected in modern history. The theory of youth-driven diffusion of fashion is an essential consideration for fashion role players in predicting and reacting swiftly to emerging trends. The youth's influence on fashion trends, fashion brands, their parents, as well as other generations' consumption behavior are prevalent throughout the fashion industry worldwide. Generation Y consumers' significant size
coupled with the important ever-increasing spending power, both internationally and in South Africa, make them an essential current and future market segment. And that is why fashion trends amongst the youth has been and will remain the focus of my research in Devoise. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to extend a, a few words of thanks. Um, first, thank you to the Northwest University for this opportunity. And for FEMS, the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences, for hosting this event. Thank you to all the members of the academic procession, as well as Dr. Hans Britz, for the spiritual guidance and opening the function with a prayer and your kind words. Then, a special word of thanks to the School of Management Sciences for your continuous support. I would also like to acknowledge the work of all my masters and PhD students. In addition, I am grateful for the support that I have received and continue to receive from several colleagues who have been instrumental in shaping my career. And these include Prof. Linda Duplessis, Herman van der Merwe, Pep Surjal, Wijnand Grobler, Renier Janssen van Rensburg, and last, but most importantly, my research partner, Aisha Bevendai. Then, to the organizers of this event, Lorenda Minne, Esme Labeskachny, Hilay Juiste, Shantai Smith, Rianai Dalziel, thank you very much. I know you have put in many hours to arrange this function, and it is highly appreciated. Then, on a more personal note, thank you to my parents, family, and friends for your ongoing support. Then, to my husband, Quentin, and sons, Neelan and Dylan, thank you for your ongoing encouragement and support. I know sometimes my research takes time away from our family time. So thank you for your patience and understanding and for being there for me. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening has been a great honor. Thank you and I bid you a good evening. Good evening, colleagues. Um, I know we have also colleagues that are watching us virtually, and I got a few messages of uh, college, uh, colleagues indicating that they are also enjoying your, your inaugural lecture, Natasha. First of all, I want to congratulate the, the management of the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences um, of the growth in your faculty. Um, in an inaugural lecture is a, celebrate, a celebration for the whole faculty. And in recent years, FEMS has really grown and built capacity, and um, we have seen some excellent research output. So um, it is indeed a case where success breeds success. Professor de Klerk, congratulations on this milestone in your career. You joined the Northwest University in two, uh, 2010. Um, I joined the Northwest University in 2008. Before that, we were also colleagues. And I think you will agree that that was a good career choice at the time. Um, it's clear when looking at your journey that you have um, excelled in your research and you've made a mark on the life of many students and colleagues who crossed your path during your career as a member of the Northwest University staff. I was at a graduation ceremony this morning and one of your doctoral students graduated and I thought it's quite befitting, befitting that your student graduated at the same day as your inaugural address. And uh, for those of you that attend graduation ceremonies, you will also know a graduation ceremony is Generation Y fashion in action. So 
Um, Benjamin Franklin said, the recipe for successful, achieve, for successful achievement comprises the following four steps. Choose a career you love. Give it the best there is in you. Seize your opportunities and be a member of your team. Now, it seems like you follow these steps, Natasha. We need strong researchers to advance knowledge in our academic disciplines. At the Northeast University, our current staff profile is as follows. 6% of our staff members are junior lecturers, 32% lecturers, 34% senior lecturers, 14% associate professors, and 13% full professors. So it's clear that becoming a full professor is a huge milestone. But Natasha, coming off the title of professor is also a leadership responsibility. Therefore, congratulations on join, joining the academic leadership at the Northwest University. Tonight, you made a convincing case that fashion is more than just how you look. It's indeed a big multifaceted industry concerning social dynamics, consumer behavior, and society at large. Thank you, Natasha, for the role you are playing in your discipline and in the faculty. On behalf of the university, we wish you all of the best with your future research endeavors. And we are looking forward to see many more publications, good NRF ratings, and more students that will graduate under your supervision. It is now my privilege on behalf of the university to present you with a certificate and a handmade gift.